Welcome to this short video on the bicep brachii. The next series of videos that Mike and I will cover will be the musculoskeletal system. I will be covering the muscles individually, whereas Michael will go into the functional anatomy of the muscles in particular movements, such as bicepital curls. Now, for today, I'll be covering the muscle specifically, the bicep brachii. The bicep brachii essentially means two heads, brachii, arm. Now, the learning outcomes that I want you to take away from this video is to understand the origin and insertion of this muscle, the nerve supply, and the action of the bicep brachii. Now, the bicep brachii itself is a flexor of the arm. It sits most anterior in the anterior compartment of the upper, upper limb. When you look at this muscle, as you can see, it's a fusiform muscle, so it tapers out at either end. Now, because it's called the bicep, that means it's got two heads, and so this is what we're referring to here. In terms of the most lateral portion, you can see this portion here, which we call the, the long head. So this is the long head of the bicep. Now, if you can imagine the, the head of the humerus is sitting there in the actual glenoid fossa of the scapula. So as it's going up towards the head, there is what we call a greater and lesser tubercle. Now there's a groove between those tubercles known as the intertubicular groove. Or, and in, in this groove, the long head tendon runs through. So it runs through that groove, which is supported over the top by the transverse ligament of the humerus. Now as that long head starts to go across the head of the humerus, it kind of starts to blend in to the capsule itself as it makes its way across to the glenoid fossa. It will actually attach at the superior part of that glenoid fossa known as the supraglenoid tubercle, but it will probably also blend into the labrum, which is a, a thickening, it's a fibrocartilage thickening around the glenoid fossa to deepen it. So the long head attachment is, or the origin is going to be the supraglenoid tubercle. So long head origin is the supraglenoid tubercle. Now, looking at the short head, this is going to attach to also the scapula, but the anterior projection of the scapula known as the coracoid process. That essentially means crow's beak. And that's the, it's going to attach to the apex of that so the short head is attaching to the coracoid process of the scapula. So both of them are attaching to the scapula and they are crossing the shoulder joint. So you can guess that this muscle will act to a certain degree at the shoulder joint. As you can see from these origins, we start, start to go now into the belly of the muscle. What you can see here is the muscles actually stay separated with connective tissue until they kind of fuse in together as we start to approach the, the lower elbow. Now, as this occurs, we kind of splay out to two insertions. We have an insertion at the radius, and this is gonna be the tuberosity. So we will have a radial attachment in the insertion, that's gonna be the radial tuberosity. And now in terms of the ulnar part, this is going to go into the bicipital aponeurosis. So it's going to kind of blend out into this kind of widened tendon which comes across and attaches to the, um, the proximal portion of the ulna. So what you can see here now is we're going to act on actually three joints. We've got the shoulder joint, with the elbow joint, but because this attaches to the radius and the ulna is fixed on the humerus, it's going to act on the radiohumeral joint. So we actually got three joints we're acting on with this muscle. Before we get to the action, however, I'll just um, cover the nerve supply. Now remember, I haven't done this video yet, but I will hope to do it with the embryology. When we look at the limbs, both upper limb and lower limb, we've got regions of those limbs that what we call the flexor compartments the extensor compartments, sometimes the adductor compartments, and possibly the abductor. Now, the way to remember it is the flexors and the adductors will always get the anterior portion of the nervous brachial, sorry, the nervous plexus, whereas the extensors and the abductors 
will get the posterior portion. So because this is a flexor, it will get an anterior portion of the brachial plexus. And the nerve in the higher part of the upper limb is going to be the muscular containers because this is an anterior division of the brachial plexus. So musculocutaneous, which is essentially C5 to C6. So remember, all flexors will get an anterior part. Now, because ulnar and, and the um, median nerve go beyond the elbow to innervate, they're going to do all the flexors of the forearm and the fingers. But the, the anterior portion of the brachial plexus that does the flexor here will be the coracobrachialis and the muscular cutaneous. So the nerve for the, brachial, the bicep brachii will be the muscular cutaneous part of the brachial plexus. Finally, finishing off on the action, well, it's slightly complicated because it crosses a lot of joints. The first thing to remember is it's a primary flexor. So when we look at the elbow, I can't put it by my side because the, the camera won't work. But if you imagine this is by my side, in full extension, it's a powerful flexor. So when the elbow is fully extended, it's a good flexor. So we will get one flexion of elbow. So that's action one. Action two, when it's fully in extension, it, even if you were prone at it, it's not going to supinate too much. But as soon as you start to flex a little bit, and now if you fix it with the tricep in this position, it can now supinate. So because of the way it's attached and the way it acts on the radio ulnar joint, once it, start, once it is flexed to a certain degree, it doesn't really matter how much, it can start to act in supination when the tricep locks it in. So it will act as a supinator. Now you can test this because at the bicep aponeurosis, which is coming down in here, this region here, this region here, in full supination, so when you're fully supinated, it is taut. So in that supinated position, you'll get the most powerful flexion. So if you could imagine if you join these two together, when you supinate and flex, you're going to get a good action in the bicep bracket. And the way it's explained is you put the cork screw in and then you pull the cork out. This is the best action of the bicep bracket. And then finally, third, we act in at the shoulder joint. The long head of the, the long head of the bicep, as it goes over the top of the head of the humerus, it will stabilize that joint. But because we're crossing the joint into the scapula, we're going to get a flexion of the shoulder. So you can actually see there's three kind of primary actions of this uh, muscle, and it's because of the relationship with these three joints, the radio ulna, the elbow, and the shoulder, and you get those three movements. So hopefully now what you can see, the bicep brachii, we know it means two heads and the brachium, well, um, it's got an origin, a long head and a short head, all acting in the um, scapula. The insertion, both radius and ulna, supplied by the anterior portion of the brachial plexus, which is a muscular cutaneous. And then the action is three, flexion of the elbow, supinate once you start to do some flexion. And it can also cause some flexion of the shoulder.